Hi, my name is Richard Stewart. I'm going to be your instructor over the next 10 weeks in our class on the knowledge of God's love. This is our first class and our first hour, so we want to take a few minutes and go over what the class is going to be about. Our class format will be videotaped lessons. We'll be taught over the next 10 weeks and the lessons will be available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and as long as you go on the internet. The class will be taught through 20 hours of videotape lessons. Each of the 20 lessons will be approximately 55 minutes in duration. There will be homework assignments, written assignments, and midterm, a midterm as well as a final examination. Now this class is going to be an in-depth study in the kingdom of God's in the kingdom of God's love for us as it's revealed in the Bible. There will be an emphasis placed on the biblical definition of love as compared to the dictionary definition of love. The study will focus on the lengths that God went to to prove to us how much He loves us and to show us through His actions how much He loves us. Now the class objective will be to for you to learn with the intention of teaching the love of God and also to teach the unfailing power of God's love and how it works, how He works with us through His commandments this commandment to the church concerning love is in uh, John 3.18 and James 2.8 and 1 Corinthians 13. Now we'll be going to those scriptures during the course of our study. In John 13.34, Jesus was teaching and he said, I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you. And in James 2.8, he says, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And in Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So if we will seek the kingdom of God, the knowledge of the king, the knowledge of his love for us, and how he made us right through his love. He promised that everything that we need in life, and if you go to Matthew and, and you read that, you'll see us talking about housing, clothing, and food. He said all of these things will be added to you. Not that you have to go out and get them, that they will be added to you. Now, the, cat, the, class, the class guidelines... Each, <clears throat> excuse me, each class video should be viewed and reviewed and the scriptural references studied until clearly understood. All the assignments should be completed and turned in timely. You will be given a due date for each assignment. You'll be able to submit your written assignments via email. Now, one of the things that you're going to learn in this is to write what's called a response paper. It's your response to the information that you have received, the information that you've been taught. The first half of the paper will be to write what you've learned over the past sessions. And then the second half of the paper gives you an opportunity a chance to meditate on what you've learned. And you will write down on the second half of the paper what you intend to do, how you intend to apply what you've learned to your life. Now, I want you to keep in mind that we said we're going to, our intention was to study with the intention of learning. And this word, comes from 2 Timothy 2.15 in the Amplified Bible. 
It says, study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling, skillfully teaching the word of truth. That's our greatest desire for you, that as you complete this school of ministry, that you will be a skillful teacher, accurately teaching the Word of God as it's related in the Scriptures. Now, the course requirement will be to successfully complete all reading assignments, written assignments, your, like I said, your response paper, and both the successfully passing the midterm and the final examination. Our overall passing grade for the course will be 70% or 70 points. Your response paper is going to be worth 10 points, your midterm 40 points, and your final exam 50 points. So you need to get at least 70 points or 70% to pass the course. Now, <clears throat> We're going to begin our study in uh, Ministry Online Training Center is designed for you to take the time to just study and study and study until you feel confident that you know the subject that you're going to teach and that you have, have and are applying the Word of God to your own life that you'll be teaching others how to apply, giving them a knowledge of, a working knowledge of the Word of God. And we're going to start off by making the statement, which is substantiated in Scripture, that Jesus is the personification of the love of God. The written Word of God, the spoken Word of God, and the living Word of God all reveal the love of God, for God is love. Now, God lets you know that you're able to love because He first loved you. The only reason we can love is because God first loved us. The only place that you'll find the true definition of love is in the Word of God. The dictionary does not give you a true definition of love. The dictionary gives you man's definition of love. But man's definition of love doesn't start to compare with the true definition of love given to us by God in the scriptures. You see, man's definition of love is always based on what someone or something does for you. God's definition, the true definition of love, is what He did for you and what you do for others based on what He did for you. Now, when we look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, we'll read this in the Amplified Bible says, in this the love of God is, re is made manifest, displayed, where we are concerned. And that God sent His Son, the only begotten, our unique Son, into the world that we might live through Him. Here God is telling us that He displayed His love. He didn't just tell us about His love, He displayed His love. He showed us how much He loved us. His words had action behind them. And in verse 10, 1 John 4, 10, it says, In this is love. Or here is the definition of love. That's what He's saying. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God said, if you want a definition of love, this is love. He is love. 
and he proved that he was love by sending his only son into the world that through his son we could come to understand what love truly is through his actions his son laying down his life for us it makes me think of, of God going to Abraham in the book of Genesis and telling Abraham, he said, Abraham, he said, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love. When I first read that, I wondered, why would God try to make him feel really bad about this? Not only his only son, but the son whom he loved. Well, that was because God was going to take Jesus, the only begotten of the Father, his only son, the son whom he loved. And he was going to place him on a cross at Calvary. And he wasn't going to provide a ram for him. He was going to sacrifice him for us, and he did. So we see that God set out to show us that he loves us so much that he would sacrifice his son. So, well, why would he do that? Because God has set up a system that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. What Adam had done, if you go back to Genesis and you read, when Adam disobeyed, God killed an animal, an innocent animal and shed the blood of that animal, covered Adam and Eve in the skin of that animal, so that blood was shed to cover their sin. But we'll see in the book of, of, of Hebrews that this blood that covered their sins, which uh, was passed on when the Mosaic Covenant, when they received the law, the children of Israel received the law, and they had all of the sacrifices and the shedding of blood. You can see in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, that this blood that they were shedding could never make those that it was shed for perfect. But the blood of Jesus has perfected us for all times. And we'll see more of that as we go along. The dictionary fails to define love, for God's love can only be understood by personal experience. Man's definition of love is always self-centered. Mankind does not have the mental ability to understand love, for God is love, and man's finite mind cannot comprehend an infinite God. We'll spend all of eternity with him getting to know the love of God. Now, his love is infinite, so we have infinity to grow in the knowledge of God's love. And we'll never fully comprehend throughout all of eternity the love of God. But what can be comprehended of the love of God, the part that we can understand, he has given to us in Christ Jesus or in his word. This is such an important subject to understand because we see in the scriptures that faith works by love. We see that love never fails. We see that we're, 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 we're saved because of his love. There's nothing more important to understand than the love of God. We receive the grace of God because of the love of God. We receive all that God has promised us because of his love. In 1 John 4, 8, he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 
See, God is not, love is not just an attribute of God's personality. It is God. God is love. And he shares that love with us through his word, through his son. We receive his son in a written form. We receive the written word of God. We know by faith that Jesus is the living word of God. But what we have here is just as powerful because the written word of God, the spoken word of God, and the living word of God all have the same power and makes that power available to us through faith in the word of God which causes us to receive the grace of God and you'll learn more about the grace of God in our class on the knowledge of God's grace but it's through faith that we receive the grace of God. And grace is really, if we break it down, grace is really God's willingness to use his infinite power and his infinite ability on our behalf, even though we don't deserve it. He does it purely out of his love for his creation. And as we get started and as we go through the course, I want you to, to, to focus on a question, how you would answer the question. And the question is, or the statement is, let me put it that way, focus on how you would finish this statement. God loves me so much that he, I was thinking of just a few things like, God loves me so much he gave Jesus for me. God loves me so much that he created this whole creation just for me. God loves me so much that he allows me to see him, the invisible God, just by looking at the creation. You'll find that over in the book of Romans. In fact, let's go to, to Psalm chapter uh, 8. The eighth psalm. Let's go to the eighth psalm and see that God loves us so much that everything He created, He created it for us and for us to rule and have reign over. In Psalms 8 1, it says, To the chief musician set to a Philistine lute, or possibly to a particular Hittite tune, a Psalm of David. This is from the Amplified Bible. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent, majestic, and glorious is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory on the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and unweaned infants, you have established strength because of your foes that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. Verse 3 When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have ordained and established, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of earthborn man that you would care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, our heavenly beings, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Here in this sixth verse we see God made us to have dominion over the entire universe. All of the works of his hands. All the stars, the galaxies, the, the, 
the expanse of space, all of it. He gave us to have dominion over. You know, when I ponder that and meditate that, I think that man is, without the knowledge of God and God's love and what he's done, man is really trifling. Worrying about very mundane things. When God has put us in a position that he wants us to rule and reign over the entire creation. We have to start to think like God thinks through his word. See who we are through his word. See what he created us for through his word. See what his infinite love has done for us, has given to us through his word. That's why we study the word. Let's go on and finish this psalm. It's a short psalm. I'll read verse 6 again. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. When he says he's put all things under your feet, means he has given you dominion over everything. That's what it means to have things under your feet. You have authority over them. In verse 7, all sheep and oxen, yes, and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent, majestic, and glorious is your name in all the earth. What an awesome thing to believe and to realize and to understand that God created this whole creation for us. It'll take you back to Genesis when you go back and look at the creation, how he took his time to create the moons and the stars and why he created them. And then at the end of Genesis 1, he said everything he created was good. Man was created good. Adam decided to join the devil and disobeyed God. Man disobeyed God because Adam was really convinced that God was holding out on him. In other words, Adam believed that Satan was telling him the truth and that God had lied. He said, well, how do you know he thought God had lied? Well, I really don't believe that he would have done what he did if he had believed God when God said, the day you eat of that tree or of that fruit, you shall surely die. Satan said, oh, you won't surely die. Now, who did Adam believe? He believed Satan. He bowed his knee to Satan. And that's how we got in the fix that we're in today. And that fix was so, that, that situation that, that he put us in was so devastating to mankind that Adam died that day. He didn't die physically, he died spiritually. He died some 900 years later, physically. But the day he did that, he died spiritually. And then when you go to the fifth chapter of Genesis, you see that everyone born after, everyone born after Adam fell was created in the image and likeness of Adam. And Adam was dead spiritually. So he reproduced dead mankind. I want us to read that. We're going to go over to, we'll go over to Genesis chapter, we'll go over to Genesis chapter 5. By the way, I'm using an electronic Bible. I know if you're taking this course online, you have a Bible. I mean, you have a computer. And if you have a computer, you can go to the website that's on your screen, and you can download a free Bible, the same one that I'm using. I must have 20 different translations of the Bible in this one program, as well as 10 or 12 commentaries, three or four biblical dictionaries, 
Bible maps, a word processor. It's all free. All you have to do is go over there and download it. Plus, there are full books that are contained in this. Some of the books that you of, of writers and people that you might have wanted to buy or study. And you can receive it all free. It only takes a matter of minutes to download it. So you have no excuse for saying, well, I don't have the study materials that you have. Yes, you have them available to you. And they are free. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 5. And verse, we'll start reading in uh, verse 1. It says, this is the book, the written record of history, of the generations and offspring of Adam. Now this is the generation and offspring of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So Adam was created in the likeness of God. Adam was like God. In verse 2, he created them male and female and blessed them and named them both Adam, man, at the time they were created. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, after his image, and he named him Seth. Well, you see, man was created in the Ab man, Adam. You see, both Adam and Eve were named Adam because they were both made in the image and in the likeness of God. They were one. And God set it up so they would always be one. That was the union of marriage that the two shall become one flesh. The two shall be one. But we see in verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness after his image, not after the image of God, and he named him Seth. So all of the people born of Adam and Eve were born in the image and likeness of Adam. Adam plunged all of mankind into spiritual death. And it took the very blood of Jesus, the one sinless man. You see in the scriptures it says that Jesus is the last Adam and he is the second man. Well, to give you just a little understanding of, of what's being said, that Jesus is the original. Adam was a copy of Jesus. See, it's only one original. That's why you, you know Jesus as he is the first and he is the last. The original means it is the first one. And if it is an original, it is the last original. You can't have two originals. So Jesus said, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the first and I'm the last. I am the real deal. But he was the second man. The firstborn from the dead. The firstborn of many brethren. And that's how we get into being identified with Jesus is when we accept the sacrifice that he made to do away, completely destroy our sins. And that was what we read in 1 John when, when we said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, and this is love. Herein is the definition of love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for us. That was what brought us back into the image and likeness of God. That's how we are now to, to go about reestablishing ourselves as those having dominion over all of the works of God's hands. It's in and through Christ Jesus. You read in the book of Ephesians where 
Jesus is seated at the right hand of God until all his enemies be made his footstool. Everything is put back up under his feet. Till his enemies be made his footstool. Well, his feet are in the feet are in the body, and we are the body of Christ, so Jesus is waiting for us to put things back in the order. He's given us the awesome task, responsibility, and privilege of putting things right, making things right. In fact, in the book of Romans, it says the whole creation groans and travails, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. This whole creation is out of order because we're to rule and reign over it and we can see without any effort at all that the creation is ruling over mankind created in the image and likeness of Adam. I listened to a teaching years ago. The title of the teaching was so so appropriate and the title of the teaching is was uh, are the plants laughing at you and here we see people now that are under the dominion of uh, marijuana a plant cold cane a derivative of a plant heroin the derivative of a plant money made out of a plant, alcohol made from a plant. The creation is actually laughing at mankind. That's why it says the whole creation groans and travail like, like a lady giving in labor pains, just waiting to be delivered from the evil one. We'll go into that more in some of the other classes. But right now we want to see that and understand that all mankind outside of Christ is lost in Adam because they were created in the image and likeness of a dead man. I want us to, to now I want you to continue to meditate on those scriptures uh, that relate to the fact that God loves you so much that he, and then go through and find the scriptures relating to what has he done for you? What is he doing for you? You can go to the book of Ephesians and if you read through the first, oh, let's say you read the first three chapters and, and, and you notice all of the things that are either past tense or present tense. When I say present tense, I mean ad infinitum. It's going to go on forever. The things that he has done, not will do, the things that he has done for us. Ephesians 1, 3, he has, for he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Doesn't say he will, it says he has. We'll go there and read a few of those. It will give you an insight into how much he loves you that he's done that he's done all of these things Ephesians the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and we'll start reading in verse 1 we'll read this in the King James Bible it says Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to all the saints which are, are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus Grace and peace be to you. Grace, verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to put a little note in that and you'll hear more about this on your class on grace. But as you go through the epistles, you'll find out that every epistle of Paul, in the first few verses, if not the first verse, he mentions the fact that grace is for us. Grace is multiplied for us. Grace be to us. This grace is given to us because of God's love for us. It's not something we are, not something we deserve. But let me read on. <clears throat> Verse 2. 
verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, I want you to take the time if, if uh, you have an electronic Bible and if you're going through it with me on your electronic Bible, highlight that, underline that, where it says, he hath, that's old English for has, blessed us. It's not he's going to bless us. I often hear the, the phrase when we greet each other in the church and I hear different church members saying, well, God bless you, as if it's something that is to be done. And a more correct statement would be to say, well, God has blessed you. Let us give glory to God who has blessed us. We're not waiting around for God to bless us. God wants us to receive the fact that he has blessed us. And it'll change your whole thinking when you realize this is something that is already done. I'm not trying to get God to bless me. He's already blessed me. I'm not endeavoring to get God to do something he has already done. If I'm trying to get God to do something he has already done, I don't believe him to start with because he just told us he has blessed us, not he's going to. So how do I reconcile that in my mind when I'm waiting for God to bless me and he says he's already blessed me? That will shake your faith. But if you'll just by faith receive the fact, okay, he has blessed me, now how do I receive that that he's blessed me with? He has blessed me. He's not going to bless me. You can't get God to do what he's already done. But you can grow in the knowledge of the fact, okay, God has blessed me. I might not understand how to receive that blessing, but he's given his blessing to me. I don't have to work to get his blessing because he has already blessed me. I don't have to do something to deserve his blessing because he has already blessed me. I don't have to try to work, do any work to get him to bless me. Why? Because he has already blessed me because of his love for me. He didn't wait for me to earn it. He didn't wait for me to deserve it. He knew I never would have earned it. I never would have deserved it. So he blessed me before I was even born. Let's look a little further. Verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. All oh, these scriptures, students, these scriptures are so awesome if you will take the time to meditate on them. Even if you don't understand them, the Holy Spirit will give you the understanding. Our part is to meditate on them and realize as awesome as they are, they're true. This is the good news. All of this is the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's also known as the word of grace. Verse 4, according as he hath, you should underline that or highlight, that hath is old English for has. This is done already. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, some of us think that he did this from the foundation of the world, but he loved us and chose us before he said light be and light was. He wrote your name in the book of life. He chose you before he ever, until he knew that you would receive salvation, before he knew that you would have a way of being saved and spending eternity with him, he would not speak the world into existence until he knew he had provided the way for you to spend eternity with him. 
And he loves you so much that he did not do this so that you had to spend eternity with him. He did it in a way that he knew you would be able to spend eternity with him. And the only reason that you would be with him throughout all of eternity is because you want it to be. He put it in your hands. That's the message that you have to give to the world. How God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He never left us. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us in love. And it is out of his pure love that he gives us the opportunity, the ability to choose to spend eternity with him. He didn't make us robots. He didn't make us into a computer that you turn on and you turn off. God says the only reason he wants you with him is because you choose to be. When I think about it, if you know about God, you know the attributes of God, and you don't want to be with him, and he forced you to be with him, it wouldn't be heaven to you, that would be hell. You would go through all of eternity miserable. So you have chosen to be with him throughout all of eternity. And now you've been given the charge by him through the Holy Spirit to go out to a lost and dying world and let them know how much he loves them and everything that he's done for them so they can make a decision, a knowledgeable decision of whether or not they want to spend eternity with this God who is love. Let's read a little further. <clears throat> In verse... Well, let's, let's finish this verse 4. It says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, this is all about love. The love of God for you. The love of God for mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is love. Herein is love that he gave his son for us. What an awesome God, what a loving God that he would go to that lens to prove to us so that we could know without a shadow of a doubt, God loves me. It says that we would be before him without blame before him in love. Without blame means that you are right with God. That's why our class on righteousness is so important. To understand that this is, God made you right with him. Without blame, no one, can, it says in the book of Jude, no one can even bring a, an accusation against you. You are blameless to God. Someone tries to go to God about you telling, telling God what's wrong with you, God won't hear that. He says you are above reproach. You are without blame before him in his love. I can hear him say, I won't hear that. You're wasting your time if you're bringing up a child of God before God trying to place blame on him all the blame that is due to any of us was covered by the blood of Jesus. Do people do things that are wrong? Do people in the church do things that are wrong? Yes, they do. And we thank God for Jesus because Jesus died for all of my wrong. He died for all of your wrong. He died, actually died for the sin of the whole world. And when you study the love of God, man doesn't go to hell because of sin. Did you hear what I just said? I know that's an awesome statement. Man doesn't go to hell because of sin. Man goes to hell for one reason and one reason only. Men are lost because they refuse to receive the sacrifice that has removed the sin of the world. And that's Jesus they refuse to receive the love of God. 
the Word of God indicates that there are those that love the upside down way. And God loves them so much, He said, if you love the upside down way, I'll turn your way upside down. He said, there are those that love darkness more than they love light, so God gives them darkness, gross darkness, where they can't even see the light. But he doesn't do it in punishment. The punishment went on Jesus. That's the part you want to get a hold of. Because Satan will come to you trying to think that you deserve, get you to think that you deserve punishment. And you do. But you have to remind yourself that Jesus received the punishment you deserved. And that's why we praise him. That's why we honor him. That's why we call him Lord and Savior. Because of his action, not because of ours. God shows his love for us through sacrificing his son for all that we did. See, religion would have you believe that you have to do something to earn the love of God and that Jesus came to earth to make bad men good. Well, he did not. Jesus came to earth to make spiritually dead men spiritually alive. For they all died in Adam and all can live in Christ. So this is what you have to get an understanding of. So we'll stop this working to earn or trying to earn the love of God. There's a little more here, or it's a lot more here. Verse 5. I hope you're underlining these past tense. The, all of this that we're reading is either past tense or present tense, ad infinitum, present tense forever. It's not something God has to do. It's not something God is trying to do. It's not something God is going to do. These are things that God has done or he is doing and will do it throughout all of eternity. In verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Having predestinated. That's past tense. He has done this. He has set your destination to be in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to predestine. To before it happens, to end up your destination, to predestinate. He set it up. Having done this. It's not something he's going to do. He's done it already. Reasons to praise his holy name. It's reasons to get happy, to go out and share to a lost and dying world that God is not mad at us. When the angels at Jesus' birth sang, sang peace on earth and goodwill to men, God had set up the way of redemption for us. Our Savior had been born into the world. And the angels of God knew that no longer would man be in the fix that Adam had put him in. Because Jesus was going to justify us. Because God had predestinated us to be conformed to the very image of Jesus who is life. And so we can have a strong, strong consolation that what God did is so much more powerful than what Satan did in Adam. What God did in Jesus so far surpasses that. They're really not worthy to be mentioned in the same breath. I want you to see a little more. In verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He has made, he hath, it says in the King James, it means has, it's past tense. 
made us accept it. Accept it as past tense, underline the ED. And the beloved, that's in Jesus. He has done these things, church. This goes on. We've, on, we've, only, we've only been through six verses. This goes on for three chapters. In fact, that is going to be your reading assignment. To go through the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. And you make note of everything in those first three chapters that is either past tense or present tense without end. It's not that he's going to do it for a while and stop. That the things that he has done for you and the things that he is doing for you that he'll never stop doing. Your faith should grow in the love of God. When we realize the lengths that he's gone to, to do these things. Do we have time for one more? It says in verse 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In whom we have redemption. That is present tense. We have it right now is never it's never going to end in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace and his grace is infinite it's everlasting well class this has been our first hour i hope you've enjoyed it you've got a flavor of the teaching and the level of teaching that we're going to go into as we study god's word so, sit back and relax and enjoy the second hour, which will be coming to you on the next video. So until then, this is Pastor Stewart, signing off.